Okay. Um, First of all, uh, here we go. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, you, you, in the first class, and you couldn't come because you had an exam, yeah. we had everyone at least briefly introduce themselves. So, so my name is Ilya, I'm from Haifa, uh, I'm from Korea. And uh, I work in the um, Wingate Institute, Sport Institute, and uh, there's some kind of branch here, North Branch, and I uh, manage. Uh, manager of them. I've been working there for five years. Plus. That's it. Actually, I have three children. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. How many? Three. Good. 38 years old. Good. And you're getting a master's in public health or? Public health. Yeah. Okay, good. Here in the country. Yeah. I'm in the university. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to start, and I'm going to briefly talk about uh, globalization, and then we're going to hear about Tokyo, excuse me, not Tokyo, Japan, and Toyota. Okay? Globalization. So, um, Everyone had a chance to read Tom Friedman's article. Uh, what you don't realize, and you're not going to care about, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Tom Friedman wrote a 350-page book. Same title. Same title. And until this year, that was that book was required reading for this course. And I think it's a great book. I think it's worth reading. But not all of the students agreed with that. For some reason, they didn't want to read 350 pages. Uh, it's hard to understand. And then I found this article that he wrote, which I'm sure was preceded his book, right? So he's a columnist for the New York Times. Um, he has influenced my own view of life, as evidenced by my being here. Okay. And, um, I think that he has done in this eight-page article a tremendous uh, contribution to understanding about globalization. So, what did you learn from reading this article, Shelley? Um, well, you know, it takes the term "world is flat" um, from that Bangalore businessman, I think, who mentions that when. Uh, that the playing field has flattened, that um, if 150 years ago the chance of, um, of uh, uh, even an academic going up in India achieving something was very low, today if you have internet access, basically um, the world has flattened in terms of accessibility to everything. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the nutshell, that, that in a sense a lot of barriers have fallen which were previously built on you know, history of countries, financial possibilities, and he mentions that once the internet, the, the underseas um, cables, everything was set in place, and he mentions it wasn't paid for by India, yes. the, that, that basically all those boundaries and barriers have fallen and that it's like, you know, potentially one, one global community. Right. Um, Tom Friedman writes right, specifically from the U.S. standpoint that it should be perceived as a threat yeah. to U.S. economy and that the U.S. has to step up its game and not only be as good as, or it doesn't have the luxury to be the same way it was until 2000 or 2006, has to be much better to start being a, a factor in the game. Okay. David? Um, one thing that was really interesting to me was how it said that some of the new economies that are progressing really fast are able to do so and pick up these new technologies because they're not burdened by older systems, which I thought was super interesting because I, I feel like I'd assumed like, oh, like we've had this technology for longer, so we'll be better, but it's not actually true. Like the resistance to change can be a huge factor. It's, uh, it's, it's a great article. It's a sum of how the world changed from the power of countries to the power of the individual. 
and the same facts that really showed us the whole process of how we went from there to there. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I thought it was interesting from his perspective because um, as an American, like you said, um, because we always talk about the American dream, you know, if you work hard enough and you are a good person, that you will live a good life. And that's very much the dream it, sometimes in America. Um, and now the whole world is getting access to that through technology. And it's interesting how Americans are perceiving that as a threat. Um, and it kind of brings you back to the idea of if you're used to a life of privilege, um, when things get more equal, it feels like a threat to you and it feels like um, problems to you. So it's really interesting reading, I mean, great article, great points, but really interested reading from his perspective as someone who's always had this privilege and now he's saying, you know, um, do your homework because there's kids that are looking for your jobs. Um, so coming from a defensive standpoint, it was really interesting and kind of sad. Mr. Bell? Well, many of the things they have already said, <clears throat> one other interesting thing in the general view that I got from that article was the fact of the instability that they tried to bring out. What is today? The next day, it's completely a different mm -hmm. thing. Even if you are up today in the healthcare, and if you don't work harder to, to, to up to date technology, mm -hmm. finally you see yourself at the bottom. So it's all about instability and trying to work. Oh. Yeah, I don't want to add that um, once we talk about resources and money and the opportunities that you as a land of opportunity, that's the only way you can influence in, in, in life. But uh, it's like the opportunities were leveled, just like you said. But, yeah. So I, I have a question. I'm not sure the answer, but let's see. How many of you, of you have talked to me on Skype? One, two, I think, right? How many of you will talk to me on Skype? <laughs> One, two, three, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe not. How many will have to? <laughs> Everyone doing the capstone, right? Okay, right? Yeah. All these international students. Why? Why? Where am I going to be? You will be in the States. I'll be in the States. Yes. Yeah. Does it matter? No. Does it? Anyone. Kingdom wanted to talk to me. We set up a time and we talked. Yeah. Right? Irma wanted to talk to me. We set up a time. She was in Kentucky. You were in South Africa. No, I was oh, you were here. You were here, right? For one of the capstones last year, um, the student was in Israel. Manfred was in Copenhagen. I was in uh, in the States. It doesn't matter. Think about it. It doesn't matter. That's why I'm here, right? I read Friedman. I've been reading his stuff for years now. Okay. I read that book. And as a consequence of reading that book, I am here, I have this job. Because it doesn't matter, okay? I do my work from the States. So much of what I do, for better and for worse, is done electronically. When you want to meet with me, yes, it's nice to meet in person, but we can do it on Skype, okay? Right. Or any of the other, any of the other uh, uh, communication mechanisms. Okay, now. From an economic perspective, what's the theory? What's supposed to happen to the world economy with globalization? So let's take China. With globalization, what's happened to China? It lost the market share in production. So it's no longer a big place to go for manufacturing, for example. Other countries can do it. Okay. So let's take this apart a little bit. Ten years ago, China was rapidly rising. Okay? Let's take that first and then we'll get to today. Rapidly rising. Producing products that were good and less expensive. Um, how much of our clothing that we are wearing right now, if, if I asked you to take off your Chinese clothing, what would be left? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Okay, right? Be fun, but... Okay. Now, what's that done to the Chinese? What's happened in China? Not immediately, but this is five, ten years ago. 
Well, urbanization. Right. Urbanization. So prior to that, where were people in China? Those were rural, right. yeah. rural yeah. people. So they come into the city. There are all these complications with air pollution. But what are the good things that this has done to the people of China? Education and money. They make more money. What do they do with their money? Spend it. And what? Um, provisions. Everything. Cars, computers, cell phones, movies. What movies do they watch? Hollywood. Hollywood. Who makes that money? The US. US? They buy a computer. It's made in Japan. Although they do have a good... Uh, and their own movies. Yes. Just one second. Okay. They buy a computer. It's either made in China or Japan. But where's the software from? States. It's either Apple or it's Microsoft. It's from the States. So as we buy shirts and underwear from China, we as Americans, excuse me, the Chinese are buying our software, and they're buying the CAT scan from Siemens in Germany, and the Intel chips that are developed here in Israel. Okay? Go ahead. Um, I was just going to kind of discuss education. So uh, a job I've been doing for a while now, it's a part-time job. Um, I teach English online through a platform to Chinese Mm -hmm. Adorable Chinese children. Anybody else would like to join? Let me know. Um, it's really fun, but the platform and the technology is amazing. Like it's a million times better than Skype. And recently, there's an article that came about the, out about the company I work for, um, saying if America isn't willing to pay its teachers, China will. Um, and I mean, it, it, they pay a lot of money to have American and um, other English-speaking people like. It, talking to their kids, and they're learning English really quickly to do this. So, and this is part of the threat that Tom Friedman talks about, <clears throat> which is that now the best practice anywhere is available to anyone. So if the best ENT practice in the world is in Haifa, Israel, at Rambam Hospital, it won't be the best for long. Because there's some man in China or woman in China who's learning about what you're doing. And they're going to do it better than you for less money. And what you need to do is you need to feel that threat. That's what Friedman says. And you have to make yours better. Because if you stop, you're, you're done. You can, you can never stop with this. Quality has to go up. Cost has to go down. You can only improve as much as you can improve. I mean, there's always a limit. Even a time limit or a capacity limit for someone to grow and... No. The argument is it, you never stop making improvements. There's no limit. I mean, there's a shift in... Let's say if the U.S. was once the best uh, economy in the world, then China became... And then it's, it's a back and forth thing. It's because it's growing. It, it changes. It shifts. It shifts back and forth, yes. yes. Okay? But you never stop. <clears throat> you never stop trying. That's the argument. Okay, now, let's talk about okay, this is supposed to show you that people are going anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are today. And you can move from one place to another, you can stay where you are. Okay? The big unknown, I think, still is right in the middle is Africa. The potentials are tremendous. The successes, not yet. But why not? You have internet, you have cell phones, it will happen. That's the argument. Okay. Now, let's get back to what Kingdom said. So 10 years ago, China could, could produce and could produce, right? Today, all the rural Chinese, not all, but most of the rural Chinese have moved into the cities. The low-cost jobs are gone. The costs of manufacturing in China are higher now. So where is manufacturing occurring? Bangladesh. Bangladesh, Indonesia, <laughs> Malaysia, okay. Right, so it's amazing. The Chinese are no longer as, as strong as they were because the other countries are catching up. And eventually, I assume, Africa will too, okay. 
Right? Okay, now. What are those? Bricks. Bricks. Broken bricks. Okay? It's been a lot of time fighting. B R I C. B B R let's see. ICS. ICS. B is for Brazil, Russia, India, China. China. It's B R I C. The S is the BRICS. Okay. Yeah, but the S. The S now is South Africa. South Africa. So people people talk about South Africa, Mexico, and Turkey. Some people have those. Okay. So the argument is that these are the emerging markets, and but they're broken. What's the story? Why is it broken bricks? These are the bricks. Did anyone invest in emerging markets? Anybody with money? The two old men here? Old Older. Invest? Older, excuse me, older. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Your own money? We are, we are too young to... Yeah, to invest anything. To invest, anything. <laughs> <laughs> to invest in the emerging market because it was, it was burned out before. Right. So I'm a rich American doctor, so I invested in emerging market stocks. What happened? Went down. It went down. They went way up and then they went down. Why? What happened? They became uh, more costly. They became more costly, and the expectations weren't met. People said, oh, it's going to be up and up and up and up. Well, it wasn't. And, and Ronnie has kind of implied this. It wasn't as good as everybody said it was going to be. There were limits. They're theoretical. Theoretically, excuse me, there should be no limits, but in fact, there are limits. Those limits keep changing, and they keep going up. So what happened was, the process of globalization hasn't worked as well as people said 10 or 15 years ago. Okay. Now, today, the emerging market stocks are better. The economy is better. They've recovered just this last couple of years. Right? So they go up and down. And what happens with all economies everywhere, and systems everywhere, is they're never perfectly rising. They go up and down, and they oscillate. Okay? So, the process of globalization is not perfect. Does anyone recognize that picture? That's from Mosul two weeks ago. Like they blew up, blew up the, the mosque. They blew up the mosque, okay? ISIS blew up a mosque, famous mosque, okay? Why? Why, why am I showing you this? What does this have to do with globalization? No, it's geopolitics. What changes the... Uh... And this represents... What is ISIS trying to do? Bring back the caliphate. Why? What don't they like about today? What's wrong with this? Too westernized. Too westernized. Too threatening too modern, too new. Globalization threatens existing societies. Globalization takes away culture. We all are the same. It doesn't matter. Okay, We're all wearing clothes made in China. It doesn't matter where we came from. We all look the same. Okay, And so there's a huge resistance to globalization from traditional culture because people want what they have, particularly older people. And this is a representation of a threatening way of life. It's threatening the way of life in tradition. There's a huge backlash against globalization for these reasons. Okay. I think the similar scenario is with Boko Haram in Africa. Yes. I mean, they're, they're really fighting for the same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's even better than the last picture I showed you. And what does he want to do? How does he? What does he? How did he get elected? So he he again. Okay. What does he want to do? Oh. Build a wall. Mexico. Okay. Build a wall. Build a wall around the United States. Okay. 
What is he afraid of? Globalization. What are the people who elected him afraid of? Threatening a way of life. He promised that the coal miners would get jobs again. That's ridiculous. They're not going to get jobs again. Okay? I mean, he just made these promises, you know, from Kentucky, right? It's history. It's not going to happen. But people believe their way of life is so threatened. They want that tradition back. But hasn't he benefited from globalization? Of course. A lot. Sure, of course he has. Okay? But he is a he's a he's a populist demagogue. Okay? He's this is our generation's Adolf Hitler. I think. I mean I'm sorry, you know, I mean you understand my politics. He says what people want to hear. He doesn't have any sense of responsibility for the truth. Now he wouldn't have been elected if people weren't threatened. So, if it wasn't him, it would be someone else. That would be the argument. Okay? He's a more dramatic example, and it's very disconcerting for me as an American to, to see this, but if it wasn't him, it would be somebody else right now. So, uh, so I, I think it's not even a matter of him planting that, that, that sort of thinking into people. It's a matter of people always had those fears, but yes. they were looking for someone to speak up for them. That's correct. He happened to he, he happened has to the stumble, right? He stumbled into this yeah. at the perfect time. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about if uh, he's trying? To, uh, and I don't like the term first. <laughs> Just to say, but what about if he's trying to protect what the, for instance, for their culture is better? And um, I, I'm just taking this case like Colombia. Uh, uh, we produce rice, yes, and it's very tasty, very pure, and it comes from real. I mean, it was uh, rice, but it wasn't created in a lab. But now we are importing rice from China, and also there is now a new law that you need to buy the seeds, and the the, um, the, the people who work in the countryside they they cannot reproduce their own fields with their own seeds, they need to go to the government to buy these seeds which are no natural. Then you taste them our new rice and it's, it's like the rest of, uh, I'm sorry for saying this, but the, the rest of the world for me, they, when I went to the United States and the UK, the rice is uh, it's just like uh, plastic. You need to go to Colombia and try the real rice. <laughs> but we lose too much that. Yeah. But now because of the globalization, there is no more rice like natural <laughs> one. So, so ju just to, to say that like, there are some uh, advantages, but there are also some things that we are going to lose as a culture. Yes. It's not like a, I'm just protecting the tradition. It's just like a thinking okay. of what you have uh, that is important in your so, country. The last question, and I'll get back to this in just a minute, okay? But where is the last arrow in this circle here? What, what am I saying to you? No, no, no. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> no, the point is, we're back to globalization. The point is, nothing will stop globalization. That's what Friedman says. Nothing is going to stop this. You may try to blow up the mosque. You may blow up the mosque. You may build a wall. It's not going to stop. Nothing will stop globalization. Okay? Now, theoretically, Diego, People in Colombia should become wealthier because of globalization. So maybe they can afford to buy the special rice if they want. Okay? They'll be so rich that they can spend the extra money to buy the rice. Or maybe they'll want to buy an extra pair of pants. That will be up to them. Can we say, like in the example of China, rising as an economy, can we say that this? kind of globalization was on the expense of quality of things because China offered cheaper um, workforce, uh, offered faster um, uh, supply, supply, and supplying the goods, so it was really on the expense of the quality and people people accepted that because it was affordable for so many. So, so in the case of Colombia, we say that if if we could preserve the quality of the product there by investing more money, this would uh, reduce the effect of globalization. So, so one of the 
one of the arguments that the globalists make is that quality should go up and cost should go down. As a competition? Yes, the continuous pressure to identify best practices and to, and to exceed those best practices. It is capitalism, okay? That competition should drive higher quality, but it's always going to be tested. So today, the rice is less good. But if there's a desire for better rice, More someone in Colombia should learn how to make that rice just as inexpensive as Chinese rice. And the Chinese have been successful because they have done a very good job with making higher quality. Now, the Chinese just make it good enough, I think, okay? And sometimes it isn't good enough. So they, they're testing the bottom of that, okay? The Germans make the best of the best. Their challenge is to keep the cost down. Mm -hmm. So you buy German, it's always going to be good. The question is, will it be inexpensive? Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms, of, in terms of health, uh, globalization is a good thing because, uh, of, for example, let's take the same example uh, in Colombia. Um, we don't have technology that uh, falls in the United States or uh, Europe. So that that is a good way to. Sure. To so I contend. Just one second, okay? I contend that as it relates to health, globalization is good because we are finding best practices. Now we're competing everywhere in the world for the best practice. And there's no reason not to find it. It can be found anywhere in Alpha Israel, okay? Right? Maybe that is the best, and everyone else needs to find it, okay? And then globalization is lowering costs. So drugs should be less expensive. And in some countries, they are, okay? And more drugs are available. There's more innovation, okay? 15 years ago, 20 years ago, who heard of Teva? Today, it's the biggest pharmaceutical, generic pharmaceutical company in the world, ever, anywhere, okay, right? Why? Because of globalization. You can make it anywhere, you can sell it anywhere. It's gonna lower the cost, it should raise, it, it does raise the dollar. So, Counter to what Diego said, I think there's actually a negative side to globalization from a global health standpoint, specifically with uh, communicable diseases. One, and then two, the issue of threatening a way of life and tradition. Like what you saw in Sweden, where there's a certain way of life, a certain way of dealing with their health issues, and there are these people coming from other, you know, with their different mindset and, you know, different perception of severity, like uh, uh, severity to a disease or whatever. And I mean, if you just think about, uh, let's say like swine flu or whatever, these are driven by a globalization. Yes, so one of the better examples, and we can spend a whole hour and we have to move on, so we're gonna stop, but Ebola is an example of globalization. It starts in Africa, there's a global mobilization to fight it, but it isn't held in Africa because people get on airplanes and they fly around the world. That's also globalization, that's correct, okay? So, countries need to realize today that you can't, you can't build a wall. It's just not that simple. You can't isolate yourself, okay? You can't, excuse me, you can't say, well, I'm identifying six countries and will keep people from coming to my country and that's gonna stop terrorism. It's ridiculous, okay? And that's, but it's understandable because people are threatened. Look, in Israel it worked. If you look at the incidents of terror attacks before and after the war, it's yes. different situation than in the United different States. Different situation. If you look at, I'm not familiar with what's going on. Obviously, it's not our type of terror. Right. But uh, it worked. It reduced yes, significantly. It yes. If you look only at this. Endpoint, not right. like terror attack. Right, yeah. yes. So, and, and we don't have time to talk about all of those politics, but I'll just say this wall has nothing to do with terrorism. Right. Terrorists don't come from Mexico. 
it's, it's, it's two completely different well, things. Well, these things are really just doing the house that comes with them. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, we need to stop this because we have three presentations.